Can somebody just say praise the Lord? <laughs> Man, what a powerful move of God's spirit today. Amen. Yeah, come on. Let's thank God for what he has already done, what he has already spoken. The Lord shared with me last night just in prayer that he was going to do something significant today. And uh, I believe we've already seen the start of that. Amen. And so I just want to say it is such a privilege to be here today. And, um, you know, when the spirit of the Lord is moving, um, you know, I, I knew my assignment today was to bring the word. And so that gorgeous, wonderful, anointed lady leading worship, I can say that because she's my wife. So those of you who don't know, don't get nervous. Uh, you know, I knew she was leading worship and doing such a wonderful job of that. But man, just as the spirit of the Lord began to move, we just have to go with him. And uh, so I am uh, up before you again. And uh, I'm Pastor Curtis, for those of you who don't know, and just want to take a moment and say thank you to Pastors Mike and to Pastors Becky. And let's give God praise for them. I want to thank them for this opportunity to deliver the word of the Lord and also to uh, Pastor Mike Herzog, who's our executive pastor. Thank him. And uh, this person might, they might get on to me later, but I'm going to do anyway. I just want to say I'm so glad to see Pastor David here in worship with us this morning. He'll get me later for that, but uh, you are just a blessing, sir, and we just appreciate you, appreciate you being here. And I do want to say again, a big, giant, Hugingus. I don't know if it's a word, I like it, to my wife, Charmaine, for uh, not only doing a wonderful job and the team doing a wonderful job of leading worship, but she is, whether she sings or she's just quiet and being her, she's wonderful in every way. And I just thank God for you. And I thank you. You are a wonderful mother to our five children. We weren't sure if we got it right the first four times. So we decided to, well, let's try one more time and have five. That's not, that's not what happened. The Lord <laughs> blessed us. Four boys and we have the little girl, little princess and she's the last and she's the ruler of them all as I guess it really should be but I want I just want to take a few few moments to share uh, with you what I feel like the Lord really put on my heart <clears throat> excuse me specifically for today last year <clears throat> uh, Valentine's Day 2021 was the uh, first time that um, Pastor Mike and Pastor Becky asked me and gave me the privilege to uh, declare the word to you and in that moment at that time the Lord put a message on my heart called seated in heavenly places. And the whole premise of it is about the position that we have in Christ. And so a few weeks ago, when they asked me to uh, share for today, I said, okay, Lord, what do you want to do? What do you want to say? And I'm just before him saying, God, I want to hear your voice. He said very clearly, seated in heavenly places, part two. So I said, okay, that's what we're going to do. You know, when you pray and you ask God and he speaks, then you don't have to say, now, Lord, what are you saying? He's like, I just told you what we're going to do. So I'm going to ask you all to please stand with me and we're going to read the word of the Lord. I love it when we get to read it together and not just read it with our eyes, but we speak it out of our mouths because the power of life and death is in our tongue, right? And so we're going to read the scripture together. It's Ephesians chapter two, starting in verse one. You guys ready? Let's go. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, and the sons of disobedience. I believe we can say that is definitely the atmosphere and environment that we're living in right now, right? Verse 3, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Verse 6. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace 
You have been saved through faith and this not a result of works so that no one may boast. Now, before we go on, we just got to take a moment and give God praise for that right there. Come on, for that right there. It is by grace through faith that you and I are saved, not of works. It is the gift of God so that no one may boast. Verse 10, this is our last verse. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk, that we should what? We should what? One more time. We should. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your amazing spirit and presence that are already in this place today. God, we're so honored to get to stand before you. We're so honored to be a part of what you're doing and to share in your word today. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Speak through me the way you desire. Help me to say what only you want me to say and to not say what you don't want me to say. Lord, I pray for the anointing to be over every heart and every set of ears that are hearing today that we will hear what you're saying and that we won't hear what you're not saying. I thank you for the power of your spirit. I thank you for the leading of your spirit today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. For the next few moments, the verse we're going to focus on is verse 6 out of Ephesians 2, verse 6. And it says, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The names of God translation of the Bible says it this way. God has brought us back to life together with Christ, who is Yeshua, and has given us a position in heaven with him. He has done it. The scripture says he is the one who has done it. This seat is a position. It's not just a seat like what you're sitting on. It's a position. It is an assigned place that you, 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 all of us have been given in Christ Jesus. And in the first, in the the first uh, time I did this seated in heavenly places, part one, and now part two, the emphasis of this message is very, very simple. And it simply is don't give up your seat. Do not give up your seat. Don't give up up your seat. You and I must refuse with everything we can muster up in us to give up our seat. We've got to be just gritted teeth. I'm not giving up my seat. And I kept thinking when I was putting this together, like what is the best way? I feel like we could get a visual understanding of, uh, of what this is. And you know what came to my mind? That wonderful simple, peaceful childhood game of musical chairs. <laughs> Anybody know what that game musical chairs is? You guys know what that game is, what that game is. And it makes me, it made me think of that because in that, in that game and really for us in life, we've got to be determined. We got to be tenacious. We've got to be unrelenting, holding on at all costs to not give up our seat. And I thought, well, I could keep using words, but then I thought, well, let's just take a look. And and it's something, something like this. (laughs) Did he get the seat? He kept the seat, right? Man, when I saw that clip, I thought, boy, that's how we need to be with the devil. Just tackle him with the word of God. Send the word against him. Let it make him fall all the way down. But that's how, you know, that's intense, right? That, that was an intense uh, game of musical chairs. I may or may not have been in one of those before. I will, not, uh, I will not say, nor will I deny that that is the case. But the point is that in the spirit realm, in the spirit life that we live, and we are first and forever spirit. We are temporarily flesh, but we are forever spirit, right? So in the spirit realm, we've got to be this kind of determined to not let the devil, not let people, not let anything else take our seat or make us give it up. 
So what is the definition of the word seat? It simply means it's a special chair, an assigned chair of a person who is in eminence, a person who is high ranking, a person of superiority uh, and the status by it, such as like a judge or a king or a government official. From that seat that they occupy, they send out the word and it's done. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, and a seat represents a place from which authority is exercised. So in a nutshell, being seated, you and I being seated in heavenly places means we now have a place of authority, power, and identity in Christ Jesus. And you got to remember that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? He is from everlasting to everlasting. So whatever he establishes, it cannot be revoked. It cannot be changed. It is set. You and I are set in the authority and the power in the identity that this seat in heavenly places in Christ Jesus gives us. Right. But we got to know we got a real enemy. Do y'all know we have a real enemy? His name is Satan and he has all of his his imps. My dad used to call them the imps. Slewfoot, my dad used to call him. Imps, those demons, those demonic spirits that are working to try and bring about his plan in our life. Three things that our enemy Satan does not want us to understand, to grasp, and certainly not to put in motion in our lives is the authority, the power, and the identity that we have now received in Christ Jesus. And the truth is authority, power, identity, right? But the truth is, before the authority, before the power, he centralizes and focuses in on attacking our identity. Because he knows that if he goes after our identity and keeps us from fully understanding it, then we'll never get to operating in the power and in the authority. Why is that? Because he knows that if we don't know who we are, and we don't know whose we are, then we will never operate in the place of authority and power where we are. And if there is one thing Satan wants you and I to be insecure about, it is our identity in Christ. He doesn't care if you identify with anything else as long as it's not Christ. And that's what he is after. That's what he is after. Satan knows the power. He knows the freedom. He knows the boldness. He knows the confidence. He knows the competence that we possess in Christ in order to stand against him. He knows it. That's why he'll try everything in his power to either, number one, stop us from discovering who we are in Christ. How do we discover who we are in Christ? Through worship, like what we just did. Praise brings us into the the presence, into the throne room of God, enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise. And that's why, uh, and this is for some, I didn't even say this in the first service, but that's why anybody, be it a believer or an unbeliever, can really kind of get with praise. You know, we're, we're giving thanks and we're thanking God. But then the progression has to be that we move into the throne room through worship. And worship is where we get revelation of who God is and we get revelation of who we are in Christ. So he'll either try uh, one of two things. He'll try to stop us from discovering who we are through worship, through uh, spending time in prayer with the Lord, through spending time reading the word, or number two, he'll try and keep us so distracted by everything else happening around us that we forget who we are in Christ, and ultimately, and this is what he's really after, that we forget who God really is. This is his number one goal. That's his number one goal in attacking me and attacking you and attacking our identity is coming against our identity because he wants to gain the ground in our minds. Our minds are the center of our will. It's the center of our emotions. And look at this. It's the place where we receive instruction. That's it. That's the place. That's the real battle, the battlefield, the main battlefield in our lives that we're fighting against the enemy is the mind. 
That's the place he wants to gain the ground in. And Satan is waging war against us the most right there. Because again, Satan is fully aware. You got to know that he is fully aware of the power that is available to you and to me when we know and activate who we are in Christ. I remember when the Lord showed me this uh, in this particular passage of scripture and putting this message together, he just reminded me that here's, 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 if there's anything that I hope you remember from today, it is this, that when, see, when Satan sees you and you're a believer, you've accepted Christ as your savior, you've made him your Lord, you are now covered and f- cleansed and forgiven of your sins through the blood of Jesus. Now the blood of Jesus is over you. It's a protection over you. It's a keeping over you. When the enemy comes to attack you, it's not you that he sees in you. It's Jesus. It's the reflection of Jesus. And every time he sees the reflection of Jesus in you, it reminds him that he's the one who is defeated. Now, why would I tell you that? Because he is going to always think, make you and I think, try and make us think, in other words, that we're the ones who are defeated. But Jesus said, That he, Satan, is the father of all lies. So I want to hopefully bring some freedom to somebody this morning, bring some hope to somebody this morning. You and I, as I said before, we have the battlefield going on in our minds. What is that battlefield? Satan comes to us, gives us these thoughts, puts these thoughts in our head of negativity. And he'll say things like, well, you know, if you were really saved, you wouldn't have done that. I'm just going to let that sit there for a moment. Now, if you now, if Jesus was really working on your behalf, then why are you going through what you went through? Now, if Jesus really is the one who answers prayer, you've been praying for eight weeks. You've been praying for eight months. You've been praying for eight years. You've been praying for 18 years. So don't you think, this is him talking, not me. This is Satan talking. So don't you think that if he was really all that, he would have done it by now? And how many times have we been in those moments, those vulnerable moments where we are believing God and then those doubts try to come or they come, those worry and the fear and the anxiety. And then we just kind of find ourselves like, oh God, I want to help you. And I want Holy Spirit, please do it. I want you to understand something because he is the father of lies. Now you got to turn this thing back around on him. So instead of you shuddering or getting stuck in his lie, no, stop. And y'all going to think I'm crazy when I, but stop and say, you know what? Satan, thank you for reminding me of truth. What are you talking about? It's impossible for him to speak truth. So every lie that he speaks to you means that the opposite of it is what is true. So when he says, How can you be saved? You can say, thank you for reminding me. I'm so saved that you can't stand it. When he says that there's no way you're going to win, thank you for reminding me that I am not only victorious, but I am an overcomer through Christ Jesus. When he says you're not going to make it, thank you for reminding me that he who has begun a good work in me will be faithful to complete it. In other words, Satan, you came to fill my mind with lies and with doubt, but I thank you that in your doing that you've just fortified and reinforced within me that the truth of God is what will stand in my life in and through every season. Somebody give him praise. When the enemy comes and tells you, as he did to me, you're sick and you're going to die. Thank you for reminding me that I am the healed of the Lord. Thank you for reminding me that healing is my bread because I'm a child of God. 
when he comes at you, mother, when he comes at you, father, and says, your kids belong to me, you say, I thank you for reminding me that my children belong to God. My seed is the righteous seed of God, and it will prosper. They will prosper in the things of the Lord. Somebody give Jesus praise. Hallelujah. So the next time he comes at you, don't just be on the defensive, get on the offensive. And you tell him, thank you for reminding me through your lie that the, as a matter of fact, the truth is so powerful that's coming, for my, coming in my life that you're taking time to lie to me about it. It's done. It's a done deal. Thank you for reminding me. Thank you for reminding me, Satan. Amen. You and I being confident, bold, and sure in who we are in Christ is what Satan fears the very most and wants to stop at all costs. More than our gifts, more than our callings, more than our talents, more than our looks or any and everything else. Satan wants to keep us unaware and ill-equipped in our identity in Christ because he knows that we have been seated above. We've been seated above in Christ Jesus and this gives us authority and it gives us power because why? Because God raised us up and seated us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and we now have power and authority over sin, over Satan, over defeat in Christ Jesus. And here's the thing, you've got to know it. You got to know that you know that you know that you know. Notice I did not say you got to feel that you feel that you feel that you feel. Because your feelings are fleeting. I have told you this before and I will say it over and over again. If you don't like how you feel right now, just wait about 20 seconds. There'll be a new one to come right along and replace that one. So don't worry about it. You don't like it, just hold on. And then once you get used to that good one, then something else is gonna come. So we don't live by feelings, but we live by knowing and we live by knowing by living by faith that as we are seated in Christ, we are also seated above. I want you guys to do me a favor. Everybody close your eyes. Say, I am seated above in heavenly places by Christ Jesus. You got to know that. Because spiritual darkness and spiritual wickedness and all those demonic attacks of the enemy will come with nothing more than to make you feel weighted down and burdened down and so heavy and feel like you can't move, you can't make it. But the devil is a liar. Because Ephesians 6 verse 12 says this, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. They're in heavenly places, but where are you and I seated? Above in heavenly places. That's why the enemy, when he comes at you, because newsflash, principalities work through personalities, So when that principality speaks through a personality who happens to look a lot like you because they're flesh like you are, then the enemy wants you to spend your time throwing your verbal punches at that person. He wants you to spend your time uh, sending your Facebook punches. It's quiet in the building. That's what he wants you to spend your time working, trying to come against the scripture. We don't wrestle against flesh. But I'm not going to wrestle against you because if I'm wrestling against you, I'm just wasting time and giving ground to what's really behind what happened. It may have come through you because we're all a work in progress. But I can't focus on trying to gain ground, trying to come against you. This is spiritual wickedness in high places, which I have been seated above. 
in Christ Jesus. Colossians 2, 9, 10, and 15 says, For in him the whole fullness of God dwells bodily, in who? In Jesus. And you, who's you? Me and you, have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. We have the authority in Christ Jesus. Colossians says that it pleased God that all of the fullness, think about that, all of the fullness of who God is would dwell within Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus now dwells within you. What am I saying? That greater is he who was in you than he who was in the world. And that's a powerful truth. And it's a great truth. But it remains a truth unactivated if you and I don't activate it. So the bottom line is this, and I'm coming to a close in about an hour. <laughs> the bottom line, I'm just kidding. The bo- but the bottom line is this, don't give up your seat. Don't give up your seat. Don't give up your seat. Don't give it up. And we're gonna look at the next few moments through ways that we sometimes give it up. We give up our seat. And before I say that, I just have a question. You all love me, right? Okay, remember you said that before we go into this next section. Don't give up your seat to number one, to pride. Pride, refusing to submit to God and to follow his way for your life is pride. First Peter 5, 5 and 6 says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Now, I'm not always the sharpest pencil in the box, but thank God I'm in there. <laughs> but I like things that are simple and I like to understand it simply and help others understand it. So verse 5 says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So it's much more beneficial for me to humble myself that I might receive grace instead of to exalt myself and be prideful and God resist me. There's nothing like being full of pride and praying and calling out and crying to God and him resisting you because you've put yourself on the throne of your heart where he's supposed to be. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. So the enemy doesn't want you to ever get to the due time. He doesn't want you to get to that place. That's why he won't want you to be humble. But when you do, you surrender your will to God and you watch what incredible things God will do in and through you. Humble yourself. Don't give up your seat to pride. Number two, don't give up your seat to pride. Comparison. The enemy wants you and I, wants nothing more than for you and I to spin our wheels and to waste our time on comparing ourselves to others. I saw this quote from Pastor Craig Rochelle, and it says, Where comparison begins, contentment ends. Think about that. Where comparison begins, contentment ends. He says, comparison makes you feel either superior or inferior and neither honors God. Because if we operate as superior, we'll say, and how we'll know we're operating in superiority when we're comparing ourselves to others. We'll say things like, oh, I, I, would, I would never, I would never do that. I, I, no. Me and Jesus, we would never act that way. <laughs> oh, boy. Can you believe they said that? Ah, can you? Oh, I would never. And then you know what? And then when we get into a real good comparison fit, then we start texting our friends. Can you believe that? They, and you know, they're a believer too, but I, I mean, I would ne- I mean, I see what they got and what they, you know, that new house, but oh, I would never try and go. I would go about it that way right right but then it's equally as wrong 
to compare yourself in a place of an inferiority and be inferior because then you say things like this, man, I'll never be good enough. I try and I try, but everybody will always be better than me. I could never accomplish that. These are things that we say when we're comparing ourselves. And I believe Holy Spirit led me to share this with us today because the power of life and death is in our tongues. And whatever we speak out is what's going to live. And so he goes on to say, we can never fully follow Jesus if we're always comparing ourselves to others. And you know, when I read that, I thought, okay, why is it that the enemy wants to get us on this hamster wheel of comparing what I have to what they have and what they have to what I have. And, and, I, and it's because it goes back to what we read in first Peter just now, when you and I compare, guess who has our full attention? When I'm comparing, I have my full attention is on me. It's impossible for me to spend time comparing myself to somebody else unless I'm always thinking about myself. Well, that was a mouthful, wasn't it? <laughs> but you think about it. It's impossible for us to spend time making comparison unless we are fully engaged in what we are, what we have, what we don't have, who we are, who we're not. And the real bottom line is his goal, his, his purpose, the enemy's purpose is to take our attention off of the goal. What is the goal? To please God and not to compete with anybody else. That's the whole goal. God made all of us unique. You need to be excited about that. If you're not like anybody else, give God praise. He obviously thought one of you was enough or he would have made two of you, and he didn't. He made one of you because that's what he wanted. And we are all here to fulfill our divine purpose, whatever, wherever, and however that may be. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, 15 through 18 says this. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole body, if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. Stop comparing yourself to others. God has set you in his kingdom and here in this earth in your position because that's where he wants you to be because that is what pleases him. So stop comparing yourself to others and instead start exercising the authority and the power you've been given in Christ from your seat. Don't worry about anybody else's seat. You've got your own seat in Christ. Hey Amen. Number three, y'all still with me? Yes. Don't compare. Don't give up your seat to pride. Don't give up your seat to comparison. Don't give up your seat to a lack of discernment. A lack of discernment. This right here, this is where we so easily and even unintentionally, but so easily we give up our seat by not operating with discernment. First John 4, 1 says this. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. You got to test the spirits. Why would you have to test them? If there would be so obvious, you wouldn't have to test them. But because they are, they are manipulating and deceiving and let me say this, too, because it uses the word they're prophets. And so a lot of times we can think of prophets as being somebody who's standing up like I am before a crowd and making a proclamation. But a prophet is simply someone who is speaking a real prophet, speaking out what God says, false prophets. They're speaking what they want you to think God said. And that's why you may have prophets in your life who are your friends or your family members. And let's see, that's why I said y'all love me. You said you love me before we got here. 
So you've got to, you've got to, you've got to discern. Because everything that sounds right isn't right. Ephesians 5, 6 through 10 says, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Listen to verse 7. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are in the Lord. Because of what he's brought you out of, he is saying in this scripture, be aware because what I brought you out of, those who are still there are going to try and come and pull you back. But now, he says, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light for the fruit of light. How do we know what, if it's light or not? For the fruit of life is found in all that is good and right and true. Well, let me just say this to you, my brothers and sisters. You are never going to know exactly what is good and what is right and what is true if you do not take the time to learn what that is by spending time in God's word. Don't shout me down all at once. That's the only way you're going to know. And that's and then it goes on to say, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Being discerning means that you and I can perceive and understand through Holy Spirit what and who is of God and who is not. Public service announcement right here. Everyone who is with you is not for you. All right. Y'all have a good week. So, that's it. Everyone who is with you is not for you. And every good thing does not mean it's a God thing for you. Right? So we can't give up our seat by being pulled in the opposite direction by people and by things. And lastly, we cannot give up our seat. Can't give up our seat to pride. Can't give up. Don't give up your seat to comparison. Don't give up your seat to lacking of discernment. Do not give up your seat to idols and idleness. Ouch. And I say ouch. I actually typed that because it was an ouch when the Lord gave that to me. It was a, my own ouch. Because we would all say, PC, I don't, I don't worship idols. Because we always think, we think of, of worshiping idols like the children of Israel did uh, back in the Old Testament where they would take wood and metal and, and stone and they would uh, make these carvings of these images and then they would set them up before them and then they would begin to worship those things instead of worshiping God. But I submit to us all that anything in our lives that gets the most of our attention instead of God has become an idol. I expected a moment of silence on that one right there because God clearly tells us and we know this we all know the scripture Exodus 20 uh, verse 3 in the Ten Commandments you shall have no other gods before me and sometimes it innocently happens sometimes it's the things such as our career listen God wants us to do well he gave us a brain he gave us gifts. He gave us talents. He's given us abilities. He wants us to be fruitful with those things. He wants us to succeed so that we give him the glory and his glory fills the earth. But if we're not careful, the focus of succession or succeeding and success over and over, it becomes what is center in our view, center in our mindset. And therefore it becomes an idol. Our families can become an idol putting them above God, taking the time that we need to be setting aside for him, keeping him in that highest place of authority can sometimes get trumped by our family activities and all the things that we do. And I'm going to say this, and I say it uh, in love and under the leading of the Lord that, um, you know, I'm all about, I really am, I want kids, I want our kids, our five kids, to be well-rounded, well-versed in the things that are going to help them get ahead in life and participate in all things. But how do you know if that's becoming an idol when the time that you are should be setting aside to come and worship God, that you should be setting aside to spend time with God, that you're setting aside to have you and your family in the presence of God, it is now being replaced with all the activities that you are so busily doing, then it has become an idol. And if you don't like that, please schedule a meeting with the Holy Spirit and he'll help you through it. Um, 
our jobs, our money, our possessions, all these things can become idols. They're all a part of our life, but we cannot allow them to have the best of our time and the best of our focus and the best of our energy. We have to allow Holy Spirit to reveal to us when and if these things are becoming idols to us. And here's the reason why. Because it is in our nature. It's in our human nature to worship something. And that's the danger in us ever putting preachers or pastors or teachers or ministers up on a pedestal. Because this flesh always wants to worship something. You don't believe me? I'll prove it to you. When God did the incredible miracle that he did with the children of Israel, when he brought them out of Egypt, they had been in bondage for over 400 years. He sends Moses and sends these plagues. And then Pharaoh finally says, yes, please get out of our land. And not only did they leave, but they left with all of the really expensive wealth of Israel. Egypt. Egypt was a wealthy nation. They left, Israel left with all the gold, all the silver, all the diamonds, all the emeralds, all the bling bling, and all of the, the fine linens and the fine uh, scarlet cloths, all of those things they left with, right? And on top of that, God brings them through the middle of a sea. Now, I don't know if y'all think that's amazing or not, but unless you've ever done it, it's pretty amazing. A sea on dry ground. Just make sure I'm in the right place. Y'all do know that ground is not dry when it's under the sea, right? Okay. So he does all that, right? So they get on the other side and God gave them all these things because of where he was taking them to and about to do in them. So when they get on the other side, Moses says, okay, I got to go seek the face of God. I got to know what we're supposed to do, what we do next. So Moses goes on the, to the mountain and he's gone for quite some time. And the people, the people, Say to Aaron, his brother, who is the priest. Now, they just witnessed what God did right, but they said to Aaron, we got to have something to worship. So the very source and the resources that God gave that he wanted them to have to move them forward, they took it, melted it down, and created this golden calf to worship. So that's why you and I have to be so careful not to let idols take place, take God's place in our lives. Don't give up your seat to idleness. Idleness. Ooh, that was a loud one, wasn't it? Ecclesiastes 10, 18 says this, because of laziness, the building decays and through idleness of hands, the house leaks. So to be idle is to be inactive. And when I read the scripture, a lot of times I feel like we do think about idleness as they're just lazy. They're not doing anything. They're not being about, they're doing nothing. But there's another side of idleness that I want us to really look at just for a moment. And the best way to describe it is, you know, when you're in traffic, we all know and we're, in tra in, we're here in Baltimore. So we know what it's like to be in traffic. Your, your car is on, everything's working, all, everything's functioning. But because of traffic, you're just, you're sitting still, you're idling. Engine's on, but you're not going anywhere. You're not moving. You're not growing. You're not getting to the destination. And idleness is tricky because 99% of the time, we can't see that we've become idle. How do we become idle? When we stop worshiping. When we stop praying. When we stop reading the word. When we stop connecting to other believers. And you would say, well, I... I mean, I don't do that. Listen, the enemy is smart. When people say that dumb devil, he's not dumb. He's, he's patient. And so whenever we become idle, it is not something that happens overnight. We don't go to bed one night and wake up the next morning. You know what? I'm just going to be idle. We don't do that. We don't, right? Am I right? We don't do that. It's a progression. It's a progression. And listen, the giving up of your seat this is it right here. The giving up of your seat starts with giving in to your mind. Giving up of your seat starts with the giving in to your mind. Thoughts lead to words. Words lead to actions. 
and actions lead to location where then we say, how did I get here? How did I get to this place where I have become idle? And in order for us to try our best to avoid that, we got to do a spiritual self checkup. We've got to do it often. Well, how can I do that? Second Peter one five says this, but also for this very reason, this right here, what I'm about to read to you, what Peter wrote to us is how we can stave off idleness. This is it right here. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add, somebody say add, add to your faith virtue, to your virtue knowledge, to your knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble in your spiritual walk with Christ. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So remember, we're saying idleness, it's a progression. Thoughts go to words, words go to action, action leads to location. So in other words, let's progressively add to our faith virtue, add to our faith knowledge, add to our knowledge self-control, add to our self-control perseverance, add to perseverance brotherly kindness, and add to brotherly kindness love. We've got to be committed to surrender our lives fully to Jesus and depend on the Holy Spirit to not give up our seat. But that's not all. I ask you all to stand with me as we close today. So we've learned how we've got this seat, right? We've been seated in heavenly places, which is great, wonderful. We got to know that. But the next step, this, and I think this is why the Lord said do part two. We got to activate the authority of our seat. Activate it. We've got to activate it. Isn't it interesting that in Ephesians chapter two, in the same chapter, verse six says that we've been seated in uh, heavenly places in Christ Jesus, right? But by the time we get down four verses later to verse 10, it tells us we are to be walking for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We got to walk in our position of authority. We got to walk in our purpose. God said to Joshua in the book of Joshua 1, 3, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. And he says that to us today. But our feet, we're not going to be gaining any ground if we're not walking. So we've got to activate it. We got to activate it. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 19, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So today before we go, my brothers and sisters, we're gonna activate our authority in the name of Jesus. I saw this interview last week and some of you may have already seen it um, uh, on CBN and it was of John Remittis who is now a preacher of the gospel, but John grew up as a Satanist in the church of Satan. From the age of eight until he was 35, he was in this deception, in this church. And when he shared this part in this interview, this is when the Holy Spirit spoke to me so clearly of how we needed to end our time today. He said that they are trained in the church of Satan. And I know Pastor David, knows about this how from the Dominican Republic that they are trained on how to go to a region and take authority over it and here's how they're trained to do it he says he was taught if I can curse the region I can capture the people that's what they're taught in the church of Satan is how to go to a region curse it and capture the people. So we all know 
that the, the church of Satan, whatever and whoever is a part of that, it is null and void and has no power over the, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of darkness has no power over the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And so many times, the Lord has really been speaking this to me lately. So many times, we, we, I feel like as a church, as the body of Christ, we're, we're good to be on the defensive. We're ready to defend. But it's, we've got to move into being on the offensive. And just like these, these people who are deceived and in this demonic deception of trying to take authority over there, you and I have got to take that land and territory back. So this morning, we're going to activate our authority and our seat in heavenly places by taking back territories for Jesus Christ. And in so doing, and in so doing, you need to, whatever territories may be in your life, ter the territory of your family, the territory of your home, the territory of your finances, whatever it is, the territory of your body, we got to take it back. So I'm going to ask you to do something for me this morning. Everybody here in the middle to just about halfway back, I'm going to ask you to stretch your hands this way in just a moment. You're going to represent the north. Everybody from the middle back, I'm going to ask you to actually turn around and face those walls. You're going to represent, uh, your, stretch your hands towards the south. These, you guys over here for the north side, for the west. And then <laughs> make sure I have the right direction. And then I'm going to ask you guys, so those of you in the balcony, the same thing. To turn, you're going to turn in a moment. We're going to all pray together. Stretch your hands toward the east. We are going to take the territory back for Jesus this morning. We would, be, we would be deceiving ourselves if we would think that the enemy is not trying to, um, is not trying to, it, we would be deceiving ourselves if we would think that he is not actively trying to claim territory. He knows he can't, but he knows that we can. So I'm gonna ask you, and what we're going to be declaring, the Lordship of Jesus Christ over our marriages, over families, over places of governmental authority, over our schools and over our learning centers and over our churches. So I want to know, I just want to know, are there any warriors in Christ in here today ready to take the authority? So everybody here from middle back here, stretch your hands this way to represent the north. Those stretch your hands towards the back, turn towards the wall to represent the south. You guys over here, please turn towards the wall and represent the west. And these, you guys over here represent the east. And I want us all to pray out loud together as we take authority back for Jesus. Father, we come before you in the, come on, come on church. We come before you in Jesus name. And Lord, we take the territory back for you. Whatever has been cursed in this region, we declare that curse is broken in the name of Jesus and that the will of God, the righteousness of the Lord, the strength of the Lord is restored. God, every place that our feet walk, when we leave this place, God, we're declaring it for you. Lord, you said that it is ours and it's ours because we're giving it back to you. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we bind up the curse over marriages and over families in the name of Jesus. Jesus, we bind up the curse of divorce. We bind up the curse of brokenness in families. And we declare wholeness. We declare peace. We declare joy. We declare togetherness in marriages and in families. Lord, the enemy has had such an assault against marriages, but we stand on the word of God. And we declare, Lord, you are the one who instituted marriage. You are the one who created it. You're the foundation of marriage. And we pray that marriages will come back to you as the foundation. O oh Lord, you are the one who blessed and strengthened and called families. So God, we plead the blood of Jesus over families today that they will be restored and the weapons that the enemy has sent to try and destroy them and break them up. God, that it is defeated. It is rendered helpless. It is rendered hopeless. It cannot advance against your kingdom. Oh God, Lord, we pray for all of those who are in places of governmental authorities. Lord, of the believers that are placed there, Lord, help us to rise up and to stand victorious in your name. God, we pray that no agenda of the enemy in these places of authority, of governmental authority, will be able to pass, but only that which is pleasing unto you, O oh Lord, only that which will bring glory to your name, only that which will establish your word and your will is what will prosper. Father, we come to you on behalf of our schools. Come on, church, and we declare in the name of Jesus that the plan of the enemy against our schools and the plan of the enemy against our learning centers and the plan of the enemy against our 
kids. It is rendered helpless. It is rendered hopeless. It is destroyed right now and it will not advance. It will not prosper. But God, we declare the, per- the protection and the provision of you almighty God in our schools and in our learning centers. And lastly, Lord, we come before you on behalf of your church, on behalf of your bride. And Lord, where we have fallen asleep, where we've fallen dull, where we've become lethargic. Oh God, wake us up, revive us. Holy Spirit, as only you can, help us to be centers through which the fire of the Holy Ghost will flow mightily, consistently, and freely. Lord, that we will be as institutions that represent you, proclaiming your word and only your word. The flower fadeth, but your word remains forever, Lord. Help us in Jesus' name to seek you like never before, to give you all of our hearts, to give you all of our minds, to submit our wills to you, that you who established the church, Jesus, you said that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So God, we stand in this place of authority that you've given us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And we take the land back for you in the name of Jesus. Now, if you believe it, if you believe it, give him a shout of praise. the name of the Lord. Now come on with me. Raise raise your right hand. Raise both hands as we make our declarations together. Y'all ready? I am saved. I am healed. I am free. I have authority. I walk in God's authority. Change is here. God is on my side. And I win in Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us at Life Source Church. We pray that today you found hope and freedom as you experienced the power and love of God. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please let us know by clicking the link in the comments below. Again, thanks for joining us and have an incredible week.